Hello and welcome to the Science for Societal Progress podcast. For this episode, I talked with Nuno Enrique Franco about animal experimentation. And we address questions like, why do we do animal experiments at all? What can be done to reduce the amount of animal experiments? What are the regulations scientists have to comply with in order to be even allowed to do experiments on animals? And what are scientists doing to communicate while animal experiments are being done and why transparency is important? And if you want more information, don't forget to check out the show notes on our website, www.scienceforprogress.eu. It includes a summary of this episode and resources for further reading. I am your host, Dennis Eckmeyer, and you're listening to episode 15 of the Science for Societal Progress podcast. My name is Nuno Franco. Nuno is an assistant researcher at the Institute for Investigation and Innovation in Health, for short, I3S, in Porto, Portugal. And he is an expert in animal well-being and scientific research. So I've worked on animal welfare, animal ethics, regulation. I'm also currently coordinating the national network of animal welfare bodies. Animal research is done mostly in context of health research. But why do we use animals? Animals are used as proxies. We couldn't do it in, in humans. We couldn't do it from an ethical perspective, but also from... Um, practical perspective, it would be impossible to recruit to recruit the sheer number. We couldn't standardize the, the animal line, standardize the conditions if we were to do it with, with humans. And of course, some experiments are indeed somewhat invasive, and this would raise significant ethical issues. So we use animals as models for human physiology, because human experimentation at this level would be unethical. And even from a practical viewpoint, humans simply aren't good study subjects for physiological studies. How well do findings from animals translate to humans? Are animals a good proxy for humans? History has been proving that. In most cases they are, but there are several instances where we could do better, we could improve our models. It's an ongoing debate that has several layers that involve um, social issues, ethical issues, scientific issues um, as well. We all agree that the use of animals should be reduced and that there needs to be an effort to do that. The principle applied internationally is commonly known as the three R's. Replace, reduce, refine. Replace means to replace animal experiments where animal-free methods exist. Reduce means to always look for ways to obtain the same information with fewer animals or more information from the same animal. And refine means to optimize your methods to cause less harm, so less pain, less suffering and less distress. When it comes to replacement, there are claims that we could get rid of all animal research. Is that so? Here we have to do a distinction between animal testing and basic and applied animal research. When we say animal testing, we, we talk about the testing of toxicity or the efficacy of, um, of a given drug or, or any given compound. And this is um, much easier to standardize. Uh, we have increasingly new um, alternative models. I don't like the term alternative because it's, it means that it's the second um, choice. And indeed, in some cases, these uh, models are actually better, either because they're cheaper or they're faster or more, more ethical or, or all of the above. So, uh, but non-human uh, methods, whereas for basic research, in which we are still str trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of what happens in, in, in the animal, we can't model what we do not know. We cannot model a full living animal being and all the interactions between all the systems. If we could, then we had reached a point in which we wouldn't need to, because we, we would have known everything about the biology of, of that animal. In other words, we have become better at replacing tests, for example, tests on how toxic a compound is, 
by using animal-free methods like cell culture. But when it comes to physiological research, complete replacement of animal experimentation would mean that we have learned everything that there is to know. We are still a very long way from this to happen. However, there are of course ways to conduct some experiments without having to use whole living animals. One relatively new development are three-dimensional organoids. So very complex, small models of uh, not that are not just lumps of cells, but they already have some structural and physiological complexity that mimics a full organ. And we can also link with, by uh, microfluidic systems link several organs in order to in order to simulate uh, a living being and i think that technology is quite promising even for basic and uh, and applied research but we are still far from being able to uh, to stop using animals in fact the outcomes from organoid experiments will still have to be verified in the whole animal but overall, the use of organoids could reduce the use of animals. But organoids are not for everybody. I'm a neuroscientist, and for neuroscience, these organoids are hyped as quote-unquote mini-brains. To my knowledge so far, these organoids don't even come close to the intricate complexity of a real brain's microstructure. Furthermore, if you recreate a functioning brain, even a small one, New ethical problems would arise about the ability of the organoid to suffer. But this is science fiction. At this point, organoids are no replacement for most of neuroscience at all. Another important point is the cost. How do animal-free testing methods, we are not talking about fundamental research, compare to animal experimentation? Well, in terms of developing costs, developing and validating a model costs um, a lot and takes a lot of time because we have to, to, to be sure that it's a proper model and a better model than we had previously. But once you, you have it, it's um, much easier to, to produce and to keep and to stock and, and, to, and to use. And you can do high throughput testing. So let's say that um, you, you want to test um, 1,000 compounds rather than using then, then making 1,000 animal tests, each test with dozens of animals that occupy a lot of space and eat, and you have to have special facilities and special trained staff. You do it in very small, like biochips, let's, let's call them. And you, and, you have, and you do a ton of them. So... Once you develop and validate the model, it becomes much um, more affordable to use these uh, non-animal methods, in, in many cases at least. Oh, this is great news. Uh, as you maybe know, I've been a, an animal researcher up until very lately, and uh, I actually also think the, the fewer animals we have to sacrifice, as it said, uh, to science, the better. Okay. So we established that replacement of animal research with animal-free methods is possible, but only to a certain degree. There are still scientific questions that can't be answered without animal experimentation. If a researcher finds that their research cannot be done animal-free, they still can't simply find themselves some mice and just start experimenting. There are still two of the three R's left. Reduce and refine. You have three licenses to do an animal, an animal experiment. So you have the, the license of the user, so of the, the researcher. And for, for you to obtain that license, you have to have extensive training. You have to have the license for, for the project. So there's a harm benefit analysis of your project so you you write a detailed description of what you intend to do with the animals what what is the severity that you expect the your procedures to have and then uh, some harm benefit analysis will be made by the competent authority so you need that that um, authorization as well 
and you have to have an authorization a license for the institute for the establishment they call it in the legislation and this means that you have to have really well equipped safe um, facilities all your stuff has to be trained as well you have to have a veterinarian on call every every day following the animals you have to have trained technicians so there's this ecosystem of competent uh, people that are ensuring that you comply with legislation and also there are regulatory um, mechanisms to ensure that you have all of these in place so the three licenses and of course that you you comply with everything in order to for these licenses to be to be in order mice are the most used vertebrate animal in research what does it take to do experiments on mice the 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 principles that you apply when you do research with mice are the same that you you'll apply with any other vertebrate and including cephalopods which are actually invertebrates but also are also included in the legislation only primates and companion animals have let's say um, a different um, statute in the in the, the legislation but 90 percent of the regulation is the same or even or even more so in order for you to um, to uh, to get a license to do your project first you have to justify why you are doing the experiment why that mouse is is needed why you 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 couldn't do with um a non-animal method and in many cases what happens when i i tend i actually look at a lot of projects what happens is that you do have non-animal methods in place but at at some point you will move on to using the animal but you have to justify that you you that the the use is is well justified so <laughs> apologize for the redundancy and uh, also you have to classify the severity as i mentioned previously you have to classify the severity of procedures so we classify the severity of procedures in mild moderate or, or severe there's a, a somewhat separate category that for in, in which animals are completely um, anesthetized and everything that happens to them is under terminal anesthesia and the animals do not recover from it. And so I tend to consider that category separate, but you have mild, moderate and, and severe. So mild is when you, um, you inflict mild harm and this can be um, drawing blood or an interperitoneal injection or just containing and doing some behavioral research, you have a, but if it's mild, it has a mild impact, but for, for a long period, then it becomes moderate. The same thing for moderate. If you have a moderate, uh, if you, you inflict moderate harm or suffering for, but it's, if it is short term, then you classify it as moderate, but if it's long term, then it becomes severe. And then you'll you'll ask what if it, what what happens if um, your procedure is not just severe in the short term but severe in the long term? Then you are not allowed to carry out that experiment. Any procedure that results in long-lasting, unameliorated harm uh, is simply not allowed you can apply for an exception to the european commission but so far i haven't heard of anyone who has done it you also have to, to write a non-technical summary and these are available online so the portuguese people and every citizen in the eu can consult in their own language the non-technical summary which will describe the severity of the procedures, why the animal is, is being used, and then you have to ensure that every single person who will be in contact with an animal has been thoroughly um, trained and has um, a certificate and a license by the competent authority. So all of this has to be in place. And in some cases, 
the competent authority will ask, uh, will um, will tell you that they will carry out a, um, a retrospective assessment. Meaning, so if you prospectively, it's, all, it's, it's always prospectively, when you've not done the, the, the project yet, when you pros prospectively classify your project as severe, or if you use non-animal, non-human primates for any severity, then the competent authority will do a retrospective um, analysis and try to, to, to verify whether the severity was was exceeded, whether the, the benefits that you proposed were achieved, and do a reevaluation of, of the harm benefit. So there, there are a lot of, uh, of steps prior, during, and after, in some cases, the project. <laughs> so there's a lot of scrutiny. Right. So um, these, these levels of severity, how are these how are these defined do they look at the animals and the state of the animal or is it just oh it's just an injection so we don't care it's a light uh it's a light thing yeah, yeah. this is quite a um a, a big issue because there's a lot of subjectivity what is long term i mentioned long term harm or suffering or short term harm or suffering um uh, what is long term what is short term so you have to um, base your evaluation with, uh, base, you have to base it on, on experience, on the experience of the vet, on the experience of the animal welfare body, they know the outcome in terms of the clinical signs that the animal will manifest. You have to study the phenotype of the model that you use. Let's say that you have a model with a deleterious gene mutation and you have to know disease progression and understand um, at, at, e, at which point the animal will start manifesting uh, signs. You, um, there's a, actually, there's a number of workshops and I've been um, training researchers on these workshops on how to classify the severity of procedures. We're trying to harmonize uh, severity classification across Europe, but it's really, it's really hard because of the subjectivity and, and cultural differences. Um, and let even even species, the the empathy that you have towards a dog or towards a mouse or towards towards a fish, which is also a, a vertebrate, and will also be protected under the legislation, will be different. And how you assess the severity for that specific species will tend to to vary, even if you do the same the same thing. So you basically you you base a lot of your assessment on previous experience. There are also a number of uh, published examples. So you have Annex 8 in the directive, you have guidance documents in the European Commission's website, and this group by Falasa Eslav and Eklam, in which I uh, was also working on. We, we developed a few other examples, so we've published this year 12 more examples with different species with uh, procedures of varying severity. We have to uh, to have a lot of factors into consideration. Let's say if you work in the wild, you have to uh, to consider capture, for instance. If um, is tagging uh, the the animal considered husbandry, or is it contemplated when you are measuring the cumulative effect of a, of a procedure? So all, all of these um, details have to be sorted out. So this is why we, ha we are having training and trying to harmonize across, across Europe. And Falaza has, has been having a, a, lot of, of, a lot of work in this, in this regard. Since we are talking about ethics, Nuno shared with us some preliminary work he was doing on the ethical values of researchers in respect to animal experimentation. Now, um, I, I am currently in in bioethics, in animal ethics. What I'm currently researching, somewhat, some this is somewhat of a side project, but we've been um, actually trying to understand the attitudes of researchers towards animal uh, animal um, animal tests, animal research, and trying to identify which factors weigh in their consideration of replacement alternatives, of severity, 
of uh, what species they, they would choose. And we, we were also um, offering them dilemmas to, uh, to, so, to sort out. And what I've realized so far is that us researchers are not that different from the general public in the sense, for instance, that species matter. It shouldn't, well, uh, objectively, it shouldn't matter. So the suffering of a dog shouldn't be different from the suffering of a pig or the suffering of a mouse. But when you ask researchers and the severity is high, let's say, or the benefit is not perceived as, um, as high as in, uh, in another setting, then researchers will, will do an ethical evaluation of the, on a case-by-case -case basis, the same way that students, will, so there are studies with students, with uh, biology students, there are studies with uh, the public in which they propose different um, case studies varying the, the severity and varying the species. And the results completely reflect what you see by, by the general public. So from an ethical point of view, what I've pick up, picked up is that we are utilitarian in the sense that we, us researchers, tend to be utilitarian most of the times. So in, in the sense that do, we do a harm, benefit, a cost, benefit uh, analysis in the same way that the directive proposes institutes and competent authorities to do. But we also take into consideration um, the relational aspect. So the extent to which we can establish a relation uh, with the animals, so companion animals and, uh, and primates uh, are also given special consideration by, by researchers. So we're not fully um, utilitarian. Also, some of us will also have some not extreme, but some moderate animal rights perspective in the sense that you, you'll see some researchers say that doing this or that will violates the right of the animal. And I wasn't expecting that from, from researchers. I, w I was expecting researchers, scientists to be more objective, more less subjective in their, in their analysis. And it turns out that, <laughs> that they're the same as, um, as everyone else. Well, that's good to hear, right? The... Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> or should they be well, better? We won't find any extremists, <laughs> I think. But uh, yeah, but it's quite it's quite diverse. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was quite surprised to uh, to find that. And even some, um, for instance, people, scientists, the same as the general public, will think it has more merit to study, let's say, a cancer, in, uh, than obesity. Mm or drug addiction, hmm. even though there are several factors other than people's choices that drive to obesity and, and drug addiction. So they will make that uh, moral judgment. So we are not immune to, to that. And that's very interesting. And this is one of the reasons why I, I'm also interested in ethics and, and regulation and trying to, to get to the core of our attitudes and our values and understand what makes us human. And in a sense, I think caring for other species is in a way something that makes us human. It's, it's a human trait, isn't it? If you think of it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So yeah, this, this is really interesting um, research into the ethics of researchers. And was that focused on biomedical researchers or just scientists uh, in general? Uh, he actually, um, our sample was um, made of people who were either working with animals or who intended to work with animals. So it, it was biased in that sense. And this is one of the reasons why I expected attitudes and values to be somewhat different. And they were only in the sense they, that accepted that animal research was necessary. But other than that, all other factors that intervene in the in the discussion and the ethical and social debate surrounding animal animal research are there as well. Oh, that, that's that's a that's good use, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Nuno found no difference in the ethical reasoning about animal research between the general public and people working in life sciences. Except maybe that they all agreed that in the end animal research is necessary. I was wondering if the fact that some members of the public reject animal experiment outright would be because they don't know enough about it. It, it depends on whether you, you ask them, could, do, you stop someone on the street and you ask them, oh, what do you think, are you pro or against uh, the use of animals for, for testing, I don't know, chemicals? And a lot of people tell you, I am completely against it. But this is what we call a, a cold start question. But if you start your question with, Animal research has so far been quite he helpful in developing vaccines and therapies for a number of, uh, of diseases that affect humans and have been quite um, useful and important for the development of, of, of science and medicine. And then you ask, what do you think of the use of animals? Then with this warm start, then people will, will be much more moderate in their views. However, there is this small section, this small segment of, of society that will completely oppose any use of animals for any reason. And uh, I think it's a valid point of view. And I would say this segment of people is around at most 5%. But they will not do an utilitarian calculation between harms and benefits, and will, they will have a very hardcore animal rights stance, let's say. Because if you grant animals the same rights as humans, then you can't do anything to them without their consent. Whereas a human can, can, can consent, an animal can't consent. And any animal use for, um, for food, for, for work, for, for, for research is uh, out of bounds for, for, for these people. So in terms of outreach, you know that it, it will be quite hard to reach to, to those people. But I think most people, going back to your question, most people are moderates. Unless you do this very cold um, this cold, very cold start question, do you agree with, with animal research? Then more than, at least more than half of, of, of the people will be against it. You have to provide some context. And this is what we, we with, with the outreach, uh, are trying to do, is provide context. Providing the context of the usefulness of animal research is one thing outreach can do. Another way is to ensure that the public can see for themselves what is happening. One mechanism we already mentioned is that researchers have to provide summaries of their research proposals in non-technical terms. These are available online. But more is being done in terms of transparency. So you have been working on a so-called transparency agreement on animal research? Yes, I was um, somewhat involved as a, mem as a member of the board of the Portuguese Society for Laboratory Animal Science. Well, so that together with the, the ERA, the European Animal Research Association, we, uh, we had this transparency agreement between the 16 most prominent research institutes and, uh, and universities in Portugal, in which we pledged to uh, be more transparent on why and how we use animals in, in science. I think it's transparency is a much better approach than trust us. Yes, yeah. Blindly. No, of course. We are scientists. We all have PhDs. We, you should trust us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not good. I think, I th yeah, trust has to, has to be earned. And in some cases, we are not angels. There are a few instances that things go wrong and these people have to be called out and sanctions have to be in order and sometimes completely um, forbid some people of working with animals and some people shouldn't be working with animals. But overall, I would say almost all researchers working with animals are compassionate, competent uh, people. And uh, the public has to know that. So let's sum it up. 
Animal research has been tremendously useful for the improvement of our understanding of life and led to advancement in medical and also veterinarian care. Animal testing of compounds can be more readily replaced with animal-free methods than scientific research experiments. In fact, once new testing methods are validated, they are often even cheaper and easier to implement. For cosmetics, the European Union even banned all animal testing and also products which were tested on animals outside the European Union. But for animal research experiments, there is no way to replace them all with animal-free methods. We can, however, approach a question by finding out as much as possible using animal-free methods first, before we move to animal experimentation. Researchers have the same ethical reasoning and morals as the general public, and to ensure animal research is conducted humanely, they have to justify their methods and comply with strict regulations. These regulations implement the 3R principle. Replace animal research with animal-free methods if possible. Reduce the number of animals needed to gather the information that you need. And refine methods to avoid pain, suffering and distress as much as possible. And transparency is increasingly important. The public needs to know what is happening in the laboratories. This is why researchers provide summaries of their funded proposals and institutes conducting animal research are working on ways to give the public insight into their conduct. For a written summary and further readings, find the show notes to this episode on www.scienceforprogress.eu. If you have questions, critique or suggestions, get in contact by email info at scienceforprogress.eu or on social media at scienceforprogress for Twitter and Facebook. Science for Progress is free and accessible. However, in order to keep going and continue to improve and grow, we need your help. You can find information on how to support us on our website www.scienceforprogress.eu if you follow the menu to Your Support. However, the best way to support us is through Patreon. We are halfway to financing our monthly expenses and it would be an enormous relief to have that covered. Check out the perks on www.patreon.com slash cypherprogress. My sincerest thanks to those who are already supporting us. Have a good day. Bye-bye.